So in class we uh, defined a sufficient statistic and the goal of doing so was um, well there are many reasons to uh, utilize sufficient statistics in hypothesis testing in estimation um, our goal is uh, to use sufficient statistics to say something about uh, the uniformly minimum variance unbiased estimator uh, sort of we turned to that being our goal after we studied the properties of the maximum likelihood estimator so we'll see how a sufficient statistic will help us find that uniformly minimum uh, variance unbiased estimator but in this video the goal will be uh, to just review what a sufficient statistic is and then learn um, a theorem that will help us uh, easily find a sufficient statistic. So if you recall from class, a sufficient statistic, we could call it t of x to denote that it's some function of our sample. Um, it's a sufficient statistic for something. So uh, we'll say it's a sufficient statistic for theta. And it's a sufficient statistic if the conditional distribution of the sample, given the value uh, of t of x does not depend on theta. So say the probability that our, in the discrete case, that our sample is equal to some set of values. This could be a joint distribution. Given that the sufficient statistic is equal to some value, um, if this equation, once you simplify it, has no thetas in it, then t of x is a sufficient statistic. And the interpretation of a sufficient st statistic says that basically t of x captures uh, all of the information about theta in the sample. So one way you could think about this is, you know, imagine you have a set of n numbers. Basically, if, you, if your goal with these n numbers is to estimate a theta, basically, if you know that t of x is a sufficient statistic, then you can just hold on to the sufficient statistic and you could get rid of the values, right? Because we're basically saying the sufficient statistic has all of the information about theta, and so if you were going to estimate theta, the sufficient statistic uh, basically would have the information from the sample and maybe you'd take some function of the sufficient statistic like divide it by a constant, for example. But it, it has all of the information in the sample about, uh, about theta. So you could, in theory, get rid of your each value as long as you recorded, say, uh, whatever this function is. So then in class we did an example where we had a sample from a Bernoulli binomial 1p and the sufficient statistic was the sum of the xi's and basically we tried to show from the definition that the probability uh, of the uh, sample conditioned on a value of the sufficient statistic was equal to something, this quotient down here, that had no p's in it. So in this case we're estimating p. No p's show up in this conditional distribution. So does not depend on p, therefore uh, the thing we conditioned on, s of x, the sum of the xi's, is a sufficient statistic. So now let's turn to a theorem that will help us find a sufficient statistic more easily. So this theorem tells us that we can basically factor the joint PDF or PMF into two functions, two specific functions, and one of them will reveal to us the sufficient statistic. So suppose we have a random sample x1 through xn, and we have our joint PDF or PMF f of x theta. Now this factorization criterion says that if we can factor the joint PDF or PMF into a function of x, so h is a function of the sample, 
and g is a sort of special function of the sample where the data, the sample, only enters g through the sufficient statistic. And it also has the thetas in it. So again, we have a function h. h does not depend on theta, but it does potentially depend on x. And g depends on the data only through the sufficient statistic. And it also, you know, contains the thetas. Then if we can do this to the joint PDF or PMF, then this s of x is a sufficient statistic for, of course, for estimating theta. So let's look at two examples where we uh, apply this factorization criterion for a sufficient statistic of theta. So the first example we'll look at uh, a random sample from again a binomial 1p. So we already proved that the sum of the xi's um, are a sufficient statistic for p. Well we did a lot of work to get that and it turns out the work would be much easier if we just write down um, that the joint PDF, so or sorry, PMF in this case, f of x p can be written as uh, p raised to the sum of the x i's times one minus p raised to the n minus the sum of the x i's and then times a product of indicator functions. So these will be indicators that tell us that each xi is either uh, a 0 or a 1. Well in this case we can pretty easily see that this here would be our g of s of x, where s of x is the sum of the xi's. This function also contains our parameter p. And then this second factor here is just an h of x. So again, we have h of x. It's just a function of the x's. There are no p's that show up in this function. And then this function here, well, we have p uh, in two different places. But we have the sufficient statistic is the only way that the data uh, enters this part. So one thing you can immediately notice is that actually we can write this also as p raised to the n times x bar, uh, where x bar is the, the sum of the xi's uh, over n. And times 1 minus p raised to the n minus n times x bar, and then again times the product from i equals 1 up to n of the indicator functions. So here we can write this as, maybe I'll call this just for the moment um, g star of, so here s was equal to the sum of the xi's. That was our sufficient statistic. Here we have it being a function of xi. And so the lesson here is that the sufficient statistic is not unique for p. Um, it turns out that we can consider the sum of the xi's a sufficient statistic because this here is a function of the sum of the xi's. But we can also consider x bar, so the sum of the xi's over n, to be a sufficient statistic because this here, when we rewrite the PMF, this here is a function of x bar. So we can factor it in different ways, right? The factorization is not unique. So let's think about another example. Let's consider um, x1 through xn a random sample from a normal 
uh, mu and for simplicity let's let sigma be equal to 1 so we know the, the standard deviation. So in this case we can note that the joint PDF can be written as say 2 times pi times 1 for the standard deviation raised to the negative n over 2 times e raised to the minus 1 half times 1 um, times the sum of xi minus mu squared. So that's the joint PDF. The goal is to think about how we could uh, write this uh, in a way such that um, this PDF is factored into an h of x and a g of s of x comma mu in this case. So it turns out with a little bit of algebra we can show the following so we have 2 pi to the negative n over 2, that stays the same. And we can get e raised to the minus 1 half uh, times the sum of xi minus x bar squared plus n times x bar minus mu squared. So the way that we we fill in the blank here, and I'll let you try it, is basically to add and subtract x bar inside of this square. Uh, so add and subtract the same thing, you haven't changed anything, and then uh, multiply out the square in a particular way so that you end up with this squared term and this squared term, and then the cross term you can show is equal to zero. So if you do this, you'll see that the 2 pi to the negative n over 2, and then e raised to the negative 1 half times xi minus x bar squared. This here will be uh, your h of x, and then e raised to the negative one half times n times x bar minus mu squared, that will be your g of x. So here we get again an h of x, which is just a function of the data. So here we have no mu's, right, in this part times something that is a function of the data only through a sufficient statistic. So only through this x bar and it also has the mu. So that's our uh, g of say s of x mu. So just to be sure to highlight right our g of x is this term here and our h of x is this term here. And of course you could have the uh, 2 pi to the negative n over 2. You can include that in the, in the g side, in the g function. So there's no unique way to do this. And all of this suggests that s of x equals x bar is sufficient for the parameter mu. It's sufficient because we can factor it uh, in, this, in this way.